was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, he is risen, just as he said. He is not here, he is risen. Hallelujah. Let's try that again with conviction. He is not here, he is risen. Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord.
Christ is risen, yeah. risen indeed. Yeah. Please be seated if you would. This morning I want to share a few thoughts with you concerning resurrection through a doubter's eyes. Several weeks back, knowing that this morning was coming, I had a panic. What am I going to say this year? After 21 years, you begin to wonder... But my mind drifted to the one that we think of as the doubter, Thomas. He was one of the Galilean fishermen who was chosen by Jesus to follow him over his years of public ministry. Thomas, in the Greek language, it translates the Hebrew, Toma, means twin, and then he's also referred to as Didymus, which also means twin. We remember him as a man who required physical proof of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead in order to place his faith and trust in Jesus. And yet through this doubter's eyes, this morning we see the source and the significance of everything that's going on here and has gone on around the world. And so we consider him today through three texts found in one of the Gospels, John specifically. So if you have your Bible or if you want to scroll or however you get there, turn with me to John chapter 11. We actually meet Thomas in this 11th chapter really for the first time. When the news comes to Jesus that a very dear and close friend has died. Jesus and his disciples were in a village at least a day removed from Bethany. Bethany is across from Jerusalem. There's the Kidron Valley and Mount of Olives. It's on the far side of the Mount of Olives. So it wasn't very far away. Beginning at verse 1. Now a man was sick 
Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair. And it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So the sisters sent a message to him, Lord, the one you love is sick. When Jesus heard it, he said, this sickness will not end in death, but is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after that, he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. Rabbi, the disciples told him, just now the Jews tried to stone you and you're going there again? In announcing a return trip to Judea, specifically to Bethany, just not that far from Jerusalem, Jesus will be heading back into a furious storm of hatred opposition, and the most recent attempt to kill him. For if you go back just one chapter in John's gospel to verse 31, again the Jews picked up rocks to stone him. Jesus replied, I have shown you many good works from the Father. Which of these are you stoning me for? We aren't stoning you for a good work, the Jews answered, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself out God. The entire situation, Jesus now says, as he has waited deliberately to return to Bethany, what he's knowingly about to do is for the purpose of enabling his own to grasp the greatness to understand who he truly is and the authority he possesses. If you'll note verse 9, aren't there 12 hours in a day, Jesus answered? If anyone walks during the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. If anyone walks during the night, he does stumble because the light is not in him. Interesting. He continues, he said this, and then he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm on my way to wake him. And then the disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will get well. Jesus, however, was speaking about his death. But they thought he was speaking about natural sleep. So Jesus then told them plainly, Lazarus has died I'm glad you, for you that I wasn't there so that, note this, so that you may believe, but let's go to him. The purpose of Lazarus' death, to enable the 12 to grasp and understand who Jesus is as the resurrection and the life. Will you please note verse 16? Then Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go so that we may die with him. Interesting man. You see, they all knew from verse 8 that they were heading back to the very location where there was, as it were, the assassination attempt on Jesus. And now when Jesus says we must go back to Bethany, <laughs> Thomas saw the danger clearly in returning so close to Jerusalem for Jesus and for all of them. He was a pragmatist. He was a relativist. But his statement is one of loyalty. Well, if you're going to go there and die, we're going to go and die with you, Jesus. He was devoted to him. And by the way, Jesus had been speaking repeatedly of a Roman cross. But it's also another kind of a statement when he says, let's go so that we may die with him. It's a statement of hopeless despair. 
a fate that evidently is inevitable. I guess we're all going to go with you, Jesus, and I'm willing to go. And if you're bound and determined to die, I'm going to die with you. If you continue on in this chapter, on the other hand, what did he experience? Verse 25, Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Now get this next statement, folks. Get it. Everyone who lives and believes in me, who lives in me, who believes in me, will never die. Ever. Do you believe this? (laughs) Jesus is about to show them the power of those words. And then what did, what did he experience in verse 41? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me. But because of the crowd standing here, I said this so that they might believe in you that you sent me. And after he said this, he shouted in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, bound hand and foot with linen strips and with his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. (laughs) So what did Thomas experience? The glory of Almighty God, greater than any Shekinah that could have ever fallen into the God room that I talked about last week. What did he experience? The glory of God, the eternal Son. What did he experience? Here's what he experienced when you go back and consider that strange verse. If anyone walks during the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. If anyone walks during the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. What did he see? He saw the light of the world. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead for this purpose, that his own might believe and might have faith concerning the source and the very significance of what this morning is all about for you and me. By the way, when you look back in this chapter, verse 27 Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him, I believe you are the Messiah, the Mashiach. You are the Son of God. You are the promised anointed one who comes into the world. Martha's confession of Jesus. The next time we see Thomas is in John chapter 14, verse 1. This is the second text which he appears. And all the disciples are bewildered and discouraged because of what Jesus has been saying to them. He's going to go away. He says he's going to die. Now he's told them one of the 12 is going to betray him. Peter's going to disown him three times. Satan will work against all of them personally and directly. Every one of them will fall away. It is against that backdrop we read these words of Jesus. Your heart must not be troubled. Stop being agitated. Stop being stirred up. Stop being confused. Don't be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If not, I would have told you, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come back. And receive you to myself, so that where I am you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. (laughs) Lord Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? I love this guy. His question is honest. It's open. It's transparent with Jesus. And it's factual. 
No, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? But it's also filled with pessimism and despair. And I think it reveals the perplexity of all of their hearts. They're only days removed from him seeing the glory of the God of the universe raise a dead man out of a tomb. (laughs) Jesus told him, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is speaking calmly and with divine assurance and reassurance to his men. And his statement is personal. It's not a formula. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. (laughs) He's stating that he's each of these things with an authoritative assertion. Where am I going? To the Father. What is the way? I am the way. How do you find it? Through me. Jesus is speaking of our lives here and now this morning. And he's speaking of all of our future lives for those of us in him. As one who comes from that forever eternal future, having been there, stepping into time and space history, telling us as it is. Brings us to John chapter 20, verse 19. In the evening, on that first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with doors locked because of their fear of the Jews. Then Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Shalom Aleichem, peace to you. And having said this, he showed them his hands and his sides, so the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. On the evening of the resurrection day, they've gathered. Wouldn't you think of the strange circumstances of that day? Now, they're in this room, and it's locked because... Their Lord has just been crucified as an insurrectionist against the Roman Empire with the approval of the entire leadership structure of the Jewish nation, of the spiritual leaders. They're getting together. They're getting together in hiding. They're marked men. And then Jesus just is there. We usually speculate, how did he get in there? I got news for you. I don't know. You say, well, he walked through the door. That's not what the text says. It doesn't answer the curious. I don't know. But a locked door didn't keep him out. He simply comes and stands in the midst of that room. And the only thing I can say is that in his resurrection physical body, it was... The same body, but with different qualities to it. It was a physical body, but boy, was it different. He was not a ghost, a tangible, physical Jesus. He speaks to them peace, but he just doesn't say peace to you. He imparts his peace to their hearts as he speaks. And then he reveals the scars in his wrists Convincing them he indeed is the very same Jesus they just saw nailed to a cross and die. Here's what's interesting when you look at the text. Verse 24, but one of the twelve, Thomas, called twin, was not with them when Jesus came. Have you ever asked, why weren't you there, Thomas? I get the impression that he should have been. I don't know where he was at. I don't know the reason why. But by not being with the rest of the men, he missed the joy of seeing Jesus. He missed the joy of hearing Jesus. And he missed the joy of receiving from Jesus 
his peace. Verse 25. So the other disciples kept telling him, we've seen the Lord. And they said it for the next seven days. Thomas, we saw the Lord. We've seen the Lord. We've seen... I wonder how many times he heard that. We've seen the Lord. We heard from the Lord. We have a peace in our hearts we didn't have before he came to that room. He finally gets fed up at some point of the week. And he said to them, if I don't see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the mark of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. By the way, he did say he was willing to believe. Did you read it? Oh, I'm willing to believe, but only on certain conditions. And the conditions will be the conditions I determine, the standards I will set, the tests I will apply. Hearing of a risen Jesus is not enough for Thomas. Why wasn't it enough? (laughs) Here's a man who saw Jesus raise the dead. He heard Jesus state who he was. He raised the dead, his power. Stating who he was, his character. He is the eternal most high son of God, the creator of all things, one with the Father. And he experienced Jesus from a shared ministry in all of his accomplishments. But to place his trusting faith in Jesus as the resurrection and the life, as the most high, almighty creator, God of all things. Thomas, these demands of mine must be met. Or he will not, most definitely not believe, the Greek text says. Let me repeat that. In the Greek text, it says, I will not, most definitely, no, not now, not ever believe. Verse 26, as if that's a challenge to God. After eight days, his disciples were indoors again. Okay, Thomas was with them this time, and even though the doors were locked, here we go again, Jesus came and stood among them, peace to you. And then he immediately goes and addresses Thomas. Put your finger here and observe my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Do not be an unbeliever. Be a believing believer. Very next Sunday evening, all gather behind closed doors. Here comes Jesus, walking into that room, however he did it. And he knows what Thomas has stated. Why? Because he's God. He's omniscient. There's nothing he doesn't know. And each of Thomas's demands are met with a command from Jesus, put your finger here, observe my hands, reach out your hand, put it into my side, stop being an unbeliever, but being a believing believer. John doesn't actually really record what Thomas did or didn't do, I don't think. But I take it that he actually obeyed Jesus. I think he put his hands into the nail scars of his wrists. I think he took his hand and placed it into the side of Jesus. And Thomas responded, remember, he's a Jew. My Lord and my God. He's brought to a yielded embrace of his sovereign God. Jesus, the Almighty One, His promised Messiah and Savior. Remarkable confession for this Jew. Unbelievable confession from this unbeliever. From this doubter's eyes. And then Thomas is affirmed by Jesus. Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Those who believe without seeing me are blessed. 
He's talking about us. Right now, this morning, 2,000 years later. Put your name in that verse. We're blessed in a way that goes beyond Thomas. You say, wait a minute, Thomas is standing there. He sees the, the resurrected, glorified Jesus. Oh no. A faith that results from signs. Some believe because he raised Lazarus from the dead. Or from the miraculous, his upper room appearance. Or from what? I want you to look one more verse in John's gospel. This is, this is amazing, folks. I hope this grips you. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. We know from the gospel accounts, 40 signs. John picked out just a few. Seven. But he says, these are written, that I've written about, these seven signs, so that you may believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. This is being written that you might believe. Unless I see, ah, but do you get the fact that you have a greater assurance and reassurance and foundation than Thomas in that upper room because you have the word of God? That's the source of our celebration today. This is the source of our celebration. Jesus said, my word will never pass away. Every jot and tittle will be fulfilled. This is the foundation. This is why our faith is so certain. And then he says an amazing thing. John does. These things are written down that you may believe who Jesus is, all that he is, and that by leaving, you may have life in his name. What do we believe? Who he is. He is the anointed rescuer from sin. He is the most high God. He is the master. He is Lord. He is Savior. And that by trusting in him and who he is and all that he did, this is the significance of our celebration this morning, brothers and sisters. We have life in his name. Having been brought from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, being dead in our trespasses and sins with no connection with God. Dead as dead as dead can be. Being made alive. Plugged into, into an intercourse of having God's life within us. Because Jesus lives within us. So that when we die, we will never, ever, ever die. We will live eternally. The eternal life we experience now, even more so. The significance of our celebration this morning, you're not dead anymore. You're alive. You have the author of life living in you, giving you life. And you will never, ever, ever, ever die. I don't know. There's not much more I can say on a resurrection morning. You know? Fantastic. Thank you, Lord. He is risen, and we are alive. Let's stand and sing like it, okay?
again. Start the bridge. Now my debt is paid. It is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the sun sets free, oh, is free. Now my debt. Now my debt is paid, paid in full by the precious blood. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the sun sets free, oh, it's free indeed. Oh, that dismissed.